I'm so excited by so many of the things I saw this week. I think Gen 4 guidance is fantastic. I saw pricing for uh, subscriptions now in the product now as well. So, so many things for us to be excited about. At the same time, it only kind of uh, makes sense if we could demonstrate ROI, if we could show our bosses that, hey, all this money that you spent on this is actually producing a return. So that's what we're here to talk about today. I think the timing is actually pretty good because if, like me, you've spent all week getting more and more excited and hyped up about all these new developments and all the different kind of colleagues and customers you're speaking with, now it's, it's uh, you know, we're going to do all that, but we definitely need to show ROI. We definitely have to, you know, realize value capture throughout the implementation and afterwards. So that's what we're here to talk about. This technology is working so far. So I'll go first with a little bit of uh, introductions. My name is Bernard Kang. I lead the pricing practice at EY. We serve uh, companies all around the world and in all different industries. I just learned we serve Wholesome in uh, Ecuador. Is that right? Globally. But you guys are from Ecuador, is that right? And Mexico. Ecuador, okay. I've heard Ecuador is a fantastic place to retire if you uh, want to live economically. Is that a fair statement? And beautiful beaches. Yes, Galapagos Islands. I think there's a lot of medical tourism and such. So keep that in mind. You can speak with this gentleman here if you've got questions <laughs> after the session. So we work at uh, UI pricing practice, strategy, analytics, operating model, and technology um, end to end. So with that, I'll pass it to Craig, and I will pass the baton. Hello everyone, Craig Zawada, I'm the Chief Visionary Officer at Pros. I've been with Pros for 12 years and play a, a lot of roles. I work with a lot of existing customers to get the most out of the technology prospects that are looking at transforming their pricing and also overall company direction. And prior to that, I was a prior consultant for 13 years, a partner in a consulting firm and co-authored the Price Advantage first and second edition. So uh, pricing is my passion and pricing technology is my passion. So. Thank you. Pass the baton to Kunal. Sure. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Bernard. My name is Kunal Kothari. I'm a senior manager at EY. I'm based out of Houston, Texas. I've been with EY for about 11 years now, and overall 18 plus years of experience in sales, pricing, and service strategy and effectiveness. I've done a lot of CRM and CP implementations over my 18 years. I'm looking forward to sharing some insightful nuggets with you guys today and take some questions as well. Right. Thank you, Kunal. So you've probably got about 70 years of experience at the, the front of the room on this topic. There's probably several hundred years of experience in the audience on this and related topics. So if you've got a great idea or something to add to the conversation, feel free to chime in and throw your idea in. And I think we could all learn something from each other today. So why don't we talk a little bit more about value capture? So when you think about implementing software, this is not easy stuff. It's invasive. It takes time, it takes your, it takes money, it takes capital, it takes political capital, it takes your personal energy. This could, in certain, certain cases, be life changing. I see some laughing and smiling. So that, that looks like painful smiling though. Like, oh yeah, that was great. So yes, this is, this is a huge investment in time and energy capable, uh, capabilities. Um, most of you in the world of pricing will do this once, right? And so why would you go through the bother? Why would you do all that? And it's because I think all of us realize there's a tremendous value to be captured, right? Um, the book that Craig wrote on this topic that everybody in the world of pricing has been quoting for the last 20 years, 1% of prices, 11% of, of operating profit, right? That's why we do this. But clearly, there's got to be thought that we put into how are we going to actually capture value and then measure it effectively and communicate it back to our leadership so that everybody can feel comfortable that we created the value that we promised. And so there are three aspects to this that we're gonna share with you today. First, there's pre-implementation readiness. So I can assure you when the consultants or the vendor shows up on day one, they're gonna ask a lot of questions. And like, what's your data? What's your process? Who's involved? Who does what? How fast do you want this to go? Uh, how many businesses? How many products? How many customers? They're gonna ask all these questions. And if you don't already have answers to those, what's gonna happen is you're gonna feel pressure to answer those questions in the moment. And you may or may not give the answers that you would like to live with at that point. And if you don't give good answers and you give answers, a month later, they're gonna show you what you asked for and it may not be what you wanted. And if that's the case, then you're gonna have to 
pay more money or cut something else out. So those are bad outcomes. So this whole idea of pre-implementation readiness is critical. My colleague Kunal is gonna address that topic. The second point, software adoption. If nobody's using the product, there's no value created for the most part, right? And this has been an issue across the world of software for, for decades. I commonly talk with clients who are, I think uh, CRM is probably more mature in this regard, but they'll say, yeah, we're doing pretty well. We're up to like 16% adoption like one six, right? Uh, if you ask me, that's too low, right? And there's a lot of questions why, and, and Craig is gonna address this topic. Again, he happened to have written a book that addressed this topic, so that's about as uh, you know expert as we can find in this world, for sure. And the third topic, value measurement, I'm gonna address. I, I was sharing with some folks this morning, I myself am not a technologist by training. I'm more of a business. I'm very good at MBA math, like plus minus divide, subtract, and extract, I'm like an expert at extrapolation, right? But uh, there are many things around value measurement that are critical, like your CFO probably cares about. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and as consultants, we generally have to justify our, our presence and existence through these kinds of uh, conversations. So I'll, I'll, I'll close this out with that. So before getting any far, farther, any particular questions or anything that you would like to have us really emphasize as we go through these three topics? Yes, sir. Here, let me pass you this real quick. Uh, I'd just like to get a, a clearer picture on um, ROI tracking after implementation. Uh, I know there's some standard ways to do that, but uh, no business is completely standard. So um, I just want to make sure we get a good view on that. All right, so ROI tracking after implementation. Actually, we, we get that quite a bit. Any, anything else before we dive in? I'm going to do the Phil Donahue thing. Thank you. Yeah, my question kind of relates to the ROI tracking, which is if you could address the typical timelines for value realization after an implementation when those buckets of money start rolling in. All right, so um, value tracking over time. We are certainly going to run out of time before we could answer everything that we want to say or every topic we want to say. Uh, myself, Kunal, Craig, we're all available afterwards and we could follow up afterwards as well. But let, let me just dive in. I'll pass it to Kunal to address our first topic, pre-implementation readiness. Kunal? Thanks, Bernard. So for the so pre-implementation readiness, let me first start with a quote from Abraham Lincoln. Right? What Abraham Lincoln said, if you give me six hours to chop down a tree, I will spend the first four hours in sharpening the ax. Right? That's what we're talking about when you talk about pre-implementation readiness. When you hear about pricing CPQ transformation projects, you know, you have your usual suspect criteria, success criteria, you know, executive sponsorship, making sure scope creep doesn't happen, requirements are getting gathered appropriately with the right big use stakeholders. But from our experience, if we take care of three big pillars when it comes to pre-implementation readiness that you see on this slide, you would cover 80 to 90 percent of the issues that you will actually face during the implementation itself, right? The first one being system and data readiness. I, I can almost guarantee that almost every person in this room is going to raise their hand at how important it is to be ready with data, especially when it comes when you talk about pricing and CPQ implementations. Data can be your friend and it can be your worst enemy. Right? Data is like kryptonite, right? Nobody wants to touch it. <laughs> but it has to be dealt with. The second pillar, and it is one of the pillars that is usually most neglected, especially in the disguise of, hey, we are agile. We don't need any documentation. It's false. <laughs> if you don't have proper governance mechanisms, methods and approaches, and properly documented processes, you are going to have a lot of issues during implementation and post implementation as well, when you're looking to upskill your own people. The third pillar, your transformation planning and the execution. So this goes back to the point that you mentioned, that how do we have a roadmap in place and how do we have a formula in place to track the benefit of what is it that we're going to implement? That is going to sow the seeds of the topic that Craig is going to touch on, user adoption as well. I'm going to touch base on each of these three pillars 
with some real life examples, right? From real client stories that how we came across this issue and how we actually resolved it. Before I get into this, does anybody have any comments around this specifically? Uh, something that is has been a tick in the hair for a lot of you in terms of the implementations that you are already part of or are currently a part of. Any comments? Yeah, in terms of readiness, I would say what I, I find difficult is we don't seem to have good documentation, right, SOPs. I think if we had SOPs for everything, when you you know talk about readiness, it would be a lot easier. And I think that that tends to be like a, you know, this would be my second one. You know, I, I, I helped implement uh, PIM, and now I'm helping implement PROS, and, and that seems to be the hard part, because now I'm gathering, you know, documentation requirements, and there are always gaps. Six months later, they're like, oh, yeah, but we need this. Well, no, that that costs money, right? So, yeah, I mean, that, that seems to be something I run into a lot. That's pretty common as well. Oh, I'm so sorry. From my experience of in Six Sigma Master Blackbird from last 15 years, so many times when we start any transformation, we always think of starting from a zero. Forget about what exists. And and I have seen when we think of adoption, why adoption is missing, because the new solution which we are building, it may not be good the existing one. Like we we never look at our baseline and think of how to improve the baseline. And I have seen like uh, with the pros in some of businesses, their baseline is much better than the new solution which we are coming with. And and when you think of uh, moving those business to to the new solution, they they see it is nothing in me, nothing for me. I think somewhere I believe when we are thinking of this transformation, we should also think of like what problem we are trying to solve, what is the current baseline where each business is, and how how can I help to improve that baseline. So, and we're going to touch base on that on the last topic, especially the transformation planning and execution, we're going to touch base a little bit on that and what kind of uh, things should be baseline, what kind of things should we, we be looking at. Great comments there. So let's talk about the first element, system and data readiness, right? And I'll bring in a real life example over here. Uh, so we had a client over here in the med devices space. They were doing a pricing implementation and fully transparent, it wasn't pros, it was another pricing vendor. And they were struggling with it big time. And they called EUI. Yeah. And to do an assessment of where some of the big problems are that we are having. When we went in to do that assessment, we asked, to Bernard's point, the consultants are going to ask you a bunch of questions. We asked those bunch of questions that, who owns pricing in the organization? IT was pointing business, business was pointing IT. Where are your pricing governance procedures documented? We don't have any of that documentation in place. What is your data profiling plan for you to clean up your data, for it to be ready when you actually implement a system because otherwise garbage in, garbage out. We don't have a data profiling plan. And then our recommendation was that, hey, you need to be, you need external support here. You were all trying to do this in-house. And we usually always suffer with optimism bias. Whenever we start projects like these, everything is going to be nice and pretty and super, right? But guess what? Like, ask for help when help is needed. Data is not an easy area. It is one of the areas that you certainly are going to need external help. If not in the full execution of it, at least in planning for the execution of it. Right. So in this instance, what we did, we quickly we quickly set up a plan for that client. We identified two in the box model of business and IT, respective respectively owning the pricing and the product data and the customer data for them. We provided them with a data profiling plan. It was no longer kryptonite for them. They knew what to do next. Right. So system and data readiness extremely important from a pricing and CPU implementation standpoint. Right. 
The second point goes around the whole process around having standard governance methods, processes in place, right? I'll talk about another client. Now, this client was in the real estate space. They had three big business units. And this is the example of a CPQ implementation, right? And uh, again, a similar story. CPU implementation was going in the wrong direction. It wasn't completely in the wrong direction, but it was it was starting to trend too. And uh, because of the relationships that we had with the client at the executive level, our coordinating partner from the UI side, their CFO were friends. They talked about it. UI, both the technology consulting side and the business consulting side was brought into the, the, the picture over there. And again, we started asking them these questions. Where are your future state process flows? They weren't documented in the disguise of we are doing agile implementation. Where are your uh, requirements that you finally convert them to user stories? No answer. Are you using a show and tell approach to drive your requirements? Because otherwise, business is giving you requirements just assuming some things that they have in their head. And, and, and unless you actually show and tell them and so that they can give you very specific requirements, right? No answer. We gave a report out and then we actually spent just six additional weeks. So the project got delayed by six weeks, but we were able to nail down the future state process flows with the three business units, bring in as much standardization as possible. We were able to draft the user stories that were development ready. And the project ultimately was impacted only by six weeks. The CFO took that on a ready-made plate. Like this is, I would took, take this any day over a six month delay is what he said, right? So very important that you have a mechanism. You know, you have an upfront phase in your implementation where you have a heavy design phase involved to do your process, future state process flows, your uh, user stories, which are ultimately driven from the requirements that you gather from your future state process flows. Any experience on this aspect? I think this is a this is an area that sometimes really get missed out on. And if you don't choose a true transformative partner, you're going to completely miss this step. And that if that this SI, if they are not well experienced, if they're just order takers versus challenging you in the implementation process, you're going to fall into this issue a lot. So make sure that you, number one, get external help. Number two, get the right help. Get the people that are willing to challenge you, not the people that are going to just say yes every time you ask them for something. Third one. This is very near and dear to my heart. The first two were a little bit of a negative story, right? Like something was going wrong and we had to come in and correct it. This is the, the other way around. It's a positive story. So this is the client in the manufacturing space. They're a big HVAC water heater company. and uh, they were undergoing a big digital transformation. So it was not limited to just pricing and CPQ. Pricing and CPQ was just one of the elements of the digital transformation. They were on their journey to completely transform themselves digitally. They, when they issued the RFP, it was very narrowly focused. It was, hey, we want to implement CRM, right? So we basically asked them in the RFP process, when, when you're given the options to ask them questions, What's your roadmap look? What does your roadmap look like? Like, we don't have a roadmap. I'm like, isn't, aren't you guys on a digital transformation journey? They were like, yes. We were like, you have to alter what you're asking in your roadmap. <laughs> you, what you're asking is very, very limited. We persuaded and we were able to successfully persuade them that, hey, we are not going to be providing you an RFP response to on a CRM. We are going to be providing you an RFP response to get you to a five-year roadmap first, out of which CRM might be or may not be the first initiative that you might pick, right? So we went on a drive with them. We won that project because guess what? We challenged them in their thinking process. They loved that. They were not thinking outside the box. We were able to help them drive that. We won that project and uh, CRM happened to be uh, one of the first things that they picked up. The next phases are still to follow. Pricing in CPQ is the next phase that is going to come up. But what was very interesting, and Bernard is going to touch base on this a little bit, 
that we created business cases for the immediate initiatives that was on their roadmap, primarily the CRM, pricing, and CPQ, right? We took benchmarks from companies and vendors like Microsoft from pros. We looked at their internal numbers from a sales perspective, and our, this is also customer service. So from a customer service perspective, we extrapolated the numbers from a sales productivity standpoint and a service efficiency standpoint, and we were able to give them an approximate range that over the next five to seven years, what is the NPV that they could drive from these initiatives, right? And this serves a couple of purposes. It gives you a, guide, a guiding light, a North Star of where you're driving your digital transformation towards. Number two, it significantly helps you in getting executive sponsorship because your executives know what you're doing, what is coming in the next three to five. Executives are thinking three to five years down the line. They're not keep thinking about next six months. So it helps you to get that. Number three, it helps you to control scope creep, right? Because your business is going to ask for, hey, where is this and where is that? You can just bring up this roadmap and say, this is where it's going to be two years down the line, not now. So I highly recommend that, you know, uh, you have a transformation vision and a plan uh, that is a part of your implementation readiness. So this slide, I'm not going to walk through because this is the culmination of all the three case studies that I mentioned to you. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this case study. But to my point, you know, once you have the roadmap, and you have the executive sponsorship that lays the foundation, sows the seed for user adoption. And now since we are on a topic of user adoption, let me pass it over to, to Craig. We'll go over the user adoption aspects for us. So Kunal, before I start, I'm gonna ask you a question on, uh, on data readiness. One thing that uh, we've experienced over the years is sometimes companies, they think they have to have everything ready, right? And that could take years. So um, in other cases, they'll say, okay, we're not ready. We're going to have manual integrations into the system. Well, let's get started. And we build those over the time. Over time. So maybe if you can share some experience, like how do you know when you're ready without waiting too long to achieve the transformation? Yeah. So generally what we recommend is called the 80-80 approach. Because if you keep on waiting for a perfect solution, you're not going to get there. So as long as at a point where you can cover 80% of your transaction, 80% of the of, of the revenue, of covering business units that you cover 80% of the overall revenue of the organization. That will be a good point where you can say that yes, I think let's go ahead. Because guess what? You're never going to be able to have everything ready. There is no cutoff that I've ever seen or we ever ever observed when when is ready. So if you wait for the perfect moment, perfect moment will never get there. So usually it's always the 80 minute 20 rule. Think about personas and scenarios that will cover 80% of your transactions. And plan your project, excuse me, projects based on that. Yeah, and the one example I can think of is a, a client customer was, they had their, on the rebate system, they had very few rebates that they did. And, you know, it wasn't, they did it manually. Okay, just put that in manually in the system. You don't have to integrate everything uh, into the data model. Okay, so let's talk about uh, software adoption. So as Kunal mentioned, we have everything ready. We have the vision mapped out. We've bought the software, and now everyone's going to use it, right? It's uh, I think uh, it was Angela who said it's going to be a breeze. Uh, is that typically what happens? Uh, I think not, right? Usually we're asking people to change their mindsets and behaviors of using a system. And I would say that if we're going to go after this vision of creating a price advantage for a company and to adopt the best practices in, in AI, we have to focus on software adoption. And so what I wanna share with you is a, it's a simple framework that uh, we wrote about in the price advantage and we've used it at pros with uh, a lot of our customers to methodically think about hitting all of the elements of driving uh, user adoption. The first is fostering conviction. This was talked about a lot in the panel this morning. It's the why. Why are we doing this? Uh, what's our vision of the future? And what does it mean for the company and individually to the person that's using it? And then are we fostering this conviction over time 
uh, with depth across the company with frequency. And I'll go through an example of this. So that's the first element to drive adoption is you have to foster conviction. The second is developing role models. Uh, Amanda from Wesco talked about this, about spending time in sales. Uh, because if leaders are changing their behavior and acting differently, they're not going to be role models if it's just coming from the top or, say, the pricing group. And then is the performance dialogue happening in a new way given the new metrics? I'll go into more detail on that. So foster conviction, developing role models. The third is talent and skills. So if you're asking people to do something differently, they need to understand what, you know, what's the basis of guidance, for example, uh, how do I use it? And if they're not using it, there needs to be persistent follow-up in terms of talent and skills. And then the last element is reinforce with formal mechanisms. The first one here, approval processes. I'm not a big fan of speed bumps in a pricing process. I think it should be no more than 15% 15, 15 of transactions go through an approval process. But in some cases, you may need it if you're going below floor and having to, to get rigor on that. Uh, so that's a formal mechanism. Another is target and metrics. So what are the targets? What are the metrics that you're using to, to measure success? And then rewards, recognition, and consequences. So two key messages. The first message is that in our experience, approaching this in a very methodical way, systematically, am I covering all the basis, will increase the chances of driving uh, user adoption. Um, and the, uh, the second key takeaway is that um, you know, you have to follow up. This isn't something a lot, I see a lot of projects, they do it at the beginning. Okay, what's our change management plan? But there's no follow up. So it's something that you have to come back to. And you have to do all four of them. So if you do one, two, or even three of them, uh, you're not gonna increase your chances of success uh, to the greatest degree. So let me ask you, what are some of the common failure modes? Where do things break down on driver adoption, on driving user adoption? Examples? Mm -hmm. So they don't have to use it. That's a good one. <laughs> but it's irrespective of the sales people, right? If that's a negative project, that means the value is well done. Then it's bigger deal. It's well passed. Even your customer can spend. As we spent four months out of the 12 months on a golf course. That is what they want to hear. That is what drives user, drives user adoption. Yeah. The value is very key. That's a good one. Any other ones? Role models. Where does that break down? No leadership support. So you're going to slow down the business if you introduce another. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the ones we see, failure modes, fostering conviction. So the importance of pricing isn't pushed, uh, reinforced after the initial push. Uh, CEO, this is a priority, but then something else is a priority next quarter. Uh, pro story, not translated into benefits of the user. Kunal, you've touched on this, and I'll go through an example. Not brought down to how this is going to make your job easier, how you're going to make more money. So it's all talked about at the corporate level. Uh, role models. This is one where I see a lot of companies, they don't spend enough time with sales management because they're running the business. They're trying, they need deals. They need deal velocity. Uh, you're trying to interject and say, we want you to have a different conversation with your team, and we need to make that easy for you to have that conversation. So having them as role models is typically uh, one area that's overlooked a lot. Um, 
pros metrics aren't reviewed in sales meetings as an example of that. And I'll go through a best practice uh, example. Developing talent and skills. So little pricing, training made available, non-adopters, you know, they're not contacted after, why they're not using the system. And then formal mechanisms. Sometimes we think that, okay, they have all this information, you know, the processes, the systems in place, uh, but we don't spend enough time on conviction, skill, and role modeling. So we've got this system. We're not spending the time on all these other elements. And then it's under-rewarded in performance and reward systems. So I'll give you an example of a company uh, in the high-tech area. So this was uh, over a $100 billion company. And they, uh, they implemented the pro solution. And one of the things they did is they used this framework, and they came out with a plan with a, a roadmap exactly Gantt chart, when we're going to do things, and they had a, a very successful implementation, high adoption rate. So what are the things that they did? Uh, the first thing is the CEO was personally involved in the communication. Interestingly, margin was not the reason they initially bought the pros pricing. It was that it was time to quote. They were getting a lot of negative feedback from resellers that we won't even go to you if we know it's a deal that needs to be done quickly. So time to quote was just, it was, this is our priority. We have to be uh, frictionless to deal with. And in order to do that, pricing took 68% of the time in doing a quote. So if they don't fix pricing, we're not going to fix quoting. So that meant, that connected with salespeople. That affects sales revenue in addition to, to volume. So uh, margin. So she was uh, personally involved in that. Uh, targeted effort to understand the root cause of early margin reduction. So when they turned it on in a pilot region, margin went, didn't go up, and everyone was surprised. We knew the model would go up, and we thought, oh, this is going to create a negative feedback. But we went into it, root cause was because there were contracts that were pre-negotiated before they turned on the system that was driving the margin down end of the year. And so we took those out, margins uh, were positive. Uh, so that was important to be on top of that, really understand the numbers. Uh, video outlining the program and benefits. They had a, a pricing uh, podcast. They had a, a number of videos and a, as an example to drive this conviction internally. And it wasn't just one thing. They had where their resellers would come in and talk about it's much easier to quote, the pricing, it's on the mark, it's there. They had salespeople talking about how it was easier to do their job. They don't have to spend time on week, uh, nights and weekends to do pricing. And they also explain how guidance works. So one of the things in the high-tech market is it's a moving market. So a lot of the sellers were concerned, oh, you're using past data. So they explain how the guidance adjusts uh, when new transaction data comes in and built into the model. So they had a series of videos to make it, you know, it didn't open, get deep into the science, but explain to people so they can understand what this was based on and build their confidence. On role models, they had consistent uh, dialogue from the top, as I mentioned. Uh, key metrics were identified. One of the things this is my favorite measure and guidance. It's APT, average price to target. Cody knows this on our customer success team. They had one measure. It's average price to target. So when you measure people based on margin, right, there's, there could always be excuses. Well, I'm selling to big customers or I have this product mix that has an inherently low margin. But APT gets around that because you're looking at the average price to target. And you can build that up all the way at the company level, how you're doing, how you're trending. You can look at a regional level, country level. You can look at a salesperson level. So they implemented that, and it was a consistent measure. Every understood, everyone understood how it was calculated, and it served a basis of the performance dialogue. So the RVPs knew they were ranked relative to how they were doing on APT how they were improving, and the salespeople would be ranked as well. They knew where they were relative to everyone else, not with names, and they used that for coaching. So they had five and five. A sales manager would spend time on five accounts and five products where they were underpriced, where there was the most margin available if they priced a target. So that was, that's a great role model because they spent time on it. They do, They knew that the only way to increase my APT is if I understood what the T was, what the target. If I'm not looking at the target, there's no way to improve that. So that was very uh, critical to build this role modeling and build a uh, commitment because people knew it was being looked at and they were being measured uh, based on that. Uh, talent and skills, uh, country BU leaders, 
they were trained on the system. So one of the things, if you're in a global enterprise uh, or you have a distributed system where P&Ls reside in different areas, people are wary about, oh, this system's going to decide my margin, yet I'm evaluated based on margin and, and profitability. But the country uh, CFOs and BU leaders were able to adjust the guidance based upon where they knew the market or where they thought they knew the market was going or what the financial uh, pressures that they were under. And so the countries, they were able to, if they wanted to test, for example, to be more aggressive in a product line, see if they can gain market share, they could go in and put modifiers on the guidance and test it. Uh, or if they had a financial shortfall, they could get more aggressive on the pricing side of it. Um, interestingly, they found, they also had best practices. They found that the countries that sort of overmanaged it typically didn't do as well as the ones that let the guidance uh, run at it. Um, but they, they empowered the, the business leaders to, to get involved in it. Uh, Non-adopters were identified and followed up with for retraining. And then on formal mechanisms, I talked about the APT measure, universal, simple measure to measure progress. And the, they, they got um, adoption was uh, quite high in the 60, 65 percent within a few months of, of rolling out the guidance. What really accelerated it was when they had a, an accelerated quota retirement based on the target. So if you were above target, you had accelerated uh, quota retirement. If you were below target, it was less. If you were below floor, it was zero. And as soon as that happened, people need to look at it. They, you know, and they grew the confidence in this. So I think it's a great example. They generated, uh, they said publicly, over 200 basis points, hundreds of millions of dollars from the project. And that wasn't the initial reason for it. It was about speed to quote. Uh, but they also generated so both volume and revenue and continued to talk about it and are still a customer. So I think it's a great example. This isn't rocket science. This isn't you know the AI about what to do. But I think it's an example of where being methodical, making sure you're covering all these bases in a methodical way can increase the chances of really driving adoption. Okay. All right, thank you, Craig. We've got like three minutes left. And I sort of knew this was happen. So I've got until 2.15 or so. If you want to keep talking or questions, I'm happy to hang out. But otherwise, <laughs> I've got no control. All right, thank you. But otherwise, let me share some thoughts on value measurement. Value measurement, again, I said like I'm an MBA mathematician, which is, means like I'm kind of good at basic math and extrapolation. But But this is like an art as much as it is a science. And it's important to get uh, kind of an understanding of how you're going to do this as early as possible, ideally before you begin the program. So I wanted to share like three different ideas on how people typically do value measurement. And um, I'll do this kind of quickly. Like adoption is kind of like the go-to default. Everybody kind of kind of does it. Like how many people logged in? How many quotes? How many price? How many page views? How many, you know, how much of our product portfolio is in the system? Uh, the reality is that's, that's not really, um, that's pretty far from actual dollars and cents value measurement. It's the easiest thing for us to do, so we all do it. But at the end of the day, when if your CFO asks you how much value you created through pricing or CPQ and you give them this, that's going to be kind of a rough conversation. So what most people try to do, they try to get to this middle category, what I call soft value measurement. So number of price changes. So if I've if I sell a, a million units and I raise the price by a dollar in the system and, you know, so I just made a million bucks, right? right? Is that, is that going to fly? You know, we could all make that kind of argument, but that's kind of, that's kind of a grade school level kind of argument. And then there are other things like time. Uh, well, what Craig re referenced earlier, like number of hours spent on quotes. Everybody agrees. All the research shows if you can respond faster to RFQs, your win rate does go up. But again, what if your turnaround time on quotes goes uh, goes down, but your win rate goes down? And then, like, clearly, that's not the whole story. There's more to it, right? And so, although most people, you know, they they start here and they're trying to get into the middle, but even even these metrics in the middle are kind of insufficient for the task. What we really need to do is get as close as we can, as best as we can, to this concept around hard value measurement. So, actual revenue growth, margin growth, uh, actual selling price growth increased win rate and then this is where you know you, we can spend the rest of our lives trying to measure these things i'll just quickly give you two examples of how we've done it one 
Uh, we helped the client implement price uh, price optimization, and we tracked six. Uh, we tracked a hundred decisions that they made, their marketing managers made with the price optimization engine, and they changed prices and pushed it out to the market. And we waited three months, which was the sales cycle for them, and we tracked the outcome. And in that particular example, uh, 80 out of the 100 decisions turned out to be margin accretive. For them, that was a wild success. And we could tie that back to actual dollars and cents that if the CFO asked what happened, you know, you could explain, here's, here's the financial result. So I think that was probably the best that we've done or I've seen as far as the most credible way to do it because there's an actual point in time where a decision was made, an action was taken, and we could actually see the result in the market. The problem is you cannot scale that. You cannot do that forever. We were actually using paper and pencil on a notebook and kind of putting it into an Excel and kind of generating reporting in that way. So the second uh, response to the, the two questions that uh, came up earlier, like how do we scale something like this? You do need uh, a, a data model and a report. And so we've also done that with clients where we say, all right, we've got to be able to define what we mean by price improvement. So how much of price improvement is price? How much is a, is a reduction in discount, uh, discounting being offered? How much of it is coming from rebate adjustments? How much of it com is coming from mix? How much of it is coming from inflation? If we break that down and track it back to the actual data sources so that this becomes an automated report, then you've got something that's scalable. Out, well, your question, I think, was sustainable. One of you said scalable. One of you said sustainable. But both, right? Now you've got a report that the entire organization, I think Craig mentioned this point as well, you need to have reporting that's not disputable. You're not allowed to bring your own data to this discussion. Once you got everybody looking at the same report, in this case, what had previously been like a six week process for this company to report on price performance, now is an automated report that shows up, you know, whenever you want it. That, that's actually the end state that we need to get to on this sort of thing. And the final point I'll make, all the ideas that Kunal and Craig and I have shared, ideally you are, you are, having these thoughts and building these before you start implementation. And in that case, that all becomes, the value realization actually becomes part of how you think about implementing. And then at the end, you know, all of us put together a business case at the beginning to get the funding. And a lot of times at the end, we never look at that thing again, right? That's the most common case. We don't want to be able, we don't want to be creating a story at the end. Right? We want to have that story written essentially before we start, and we're just kind of filling in the punctuation at the end. That's essentially what, what it should look like when, when it goes well. So with that, I'll just say, hey, we all know why we got into this. And so the responsibility is it's incumbent upon us to figure out how to communicate, how to capture value effectively, and then communicate it effectively to your management. So hopefully you got a, one or two ideas here. Like I said, we can stick around a little bit longer. You can follow up with us directly by email and such. But otherwise, you know, I know we're, we're kind of at time, so I'm happy to, to release you. There's no bell or anything, so feel free to, to stand up and, and walk right out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming.